Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. You and I have some altar, whether it's real or imaginary, that we place upon it what we want to give or sacrifice for acceptance. Here's a loaded question. How many of you have done something wrong? There you go. And in doing that, were we not trying to at least offer an apology to make up for what we did? Why do we do that? Because we're trying to gain what? Acceptance. We're trying to be accepted again into somebody's good graces where we've deteriorated or diminished that relationship. Sometimes we have guilt that comes upon us that motivates us to that means. Sometimes it almost feels like somebody just stabbed you in the heart because you have conviction, an act of contrition maybe. Maybe it's just something simply as just saying, I'm sorry. But notice all of it is an offering forward because we want somehow to be accepted. In your handout here, I have down here, probably on the front page, little small paragraph. And I want you to read just the sentence above it, and then we'll read that little paragraph there. It says, we all live according to an altar, and we all submit some sort of offering for the sake of acceptance. This is what is known as someone's, say it, church, worldview. You make the decisions that you make. You live by the convictions that you do. You decide when to say you're sorry or to bear a grudge based off of convictions that are deeply set within you. Based on the very things that run your heart is what it is. A worldview involves how one perceives and interprets the world around them. It is the basis for one's convictions about reality. If you want to talk about what is real and what you believe is real, It's the very convictions of how you live and the offerings that you put forward. Now, let's put some feet on this and think about it. And I'm very grateful to Maxine for getting me this because I was trying to find one and she didn't give it to me till this morning. So if this is terrible, I apologize. Talk to your neighbor. I guarantee you this is how they live, right here. In fact, I I, I, I would put money on it. Because this is the scales of justice, right? Anytime that you have a case that comes up in court, you've got somebody that's arguing for one point, no, they're innocent. And another one that's in opposition saying, no, they're guilty. Now, that's not how this is run in people's lives, okay? Now, let's just say that I'm Joe Pagan, okay? Pagan's not a bad word. Does everybody know that? You can say Pagan. It's just somebody that doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. And here's the great thing is, here's all my bad works, Now, this is actually the trash can that I keep in my car, and I brought it in today. And so I'm sure I've got some driving offenses somewhere. It's going to work out well. Whoa, that's bad. And then I got some, uh, it's probably when I was mad at somebody, right? It sticks to your hand. That's not good. It's kind of gross. But that's one of those things you can't recover from, is it? That's bad work. And then, uh, yeah, you don't want to see that. (laughs) This is probably that time that uh, I thought bad about somebody but didn't tell them. I wasn't honest with them about it. But, man, I held that grudge in my heart a long time. This is when I got mad at my son. So this is all my bad works. How's that look? Looks lopsided, doesn't it? You think the guy that lives next door to you probably lives by this? Right? What's my bad works? But, 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 don't sell me out short because I have good works. This is not gold. Did my mic go out? No, it's on. Okay, good. These are your good works, right? See, the thing was is that I got caught at Walmart for shoplifting a coffee maker. Bad works. But wait a second. I was nice to the guy. Oh, that outweighs it. That's good. And shook hands with people and 
I try to be nice. And, well, I'm not as good as, I'm not as bad as the other guy, right? That's a pretty big one. So notice, maybe I have enough good works that will outweigh my bad works before God or whoever it is that really matters. I mean, that's how we live, isn't it? As long as my works outweigh what I was doing previously, I'm accepted. But does that work? Does it work? Why is that? Well, there's no blood, yes, but Jeremy, you got caught shoplifting the coffee maker at Walmart. Uh Uh-oh. But, but, wait, wait, officer. Think of all the coffee makers that were there that I didn't shoplift. (laughs) I mean, there were at least 12 of them, and I didn't even take the one that said bun on it. I took the Mr. Coffee, so I mean, in fact, there were a lot of products in Walmart that I didn't shoplift. Do you think any judge in their right mind is going to go, you know what? That's a great point. Go free. Does that work on eternity's scale? It never works, does it? And yet, how many people do you know live by the scales? In fact, let me give you a primary instance. Islam, one of the fastest growing religions in the world. They live by the scales. More good works than bad works. The problem is, is you can never know if you have more good works than bad works. And so you've got to find some way to tip the scales in your favor. Therefore, we have death for a holy cause. How about the whole idea of karma, right? If you do enough good things for people, it will cancel out the bad things. And if you do the good, the good will come around back to you. Is that true? No, I know a lot of gracious and giving and sacrificial servant minded Christians who don't have any kind of repayment here in this life, but a rich reward in the future. So notice, regardless of whatever I think all my good stuff is that I could lay out here on the table and look how it's worth, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, does it? Here's the problem. The problem is, is that even though I've done bad, I deserve to be punished for the one bad thing. So in doing so, This is really my problem. My problem is that, number one, I have sin. The very basic thing of all of it is, is I have a sin problem. I can't help but to do wrong. That's what's going to happen. With the sin problem, it incurs consequences of anything that I do. Anybody ever sinned and had consequences? In fact, the whole desirous lust that we have after sin is, can I sin and get out from under the consequences? Or here's how we say it, can I get away with it? Now, we'd never say that out loud. That makes us sound sinful. But does it not roll around in here? It does. So not only do I have the problem of consequences, but sin is deserving of what? Death. Every person that sins deserves to die. In fact, sin leads to death. In fact, even one sin is enough to take your entire life away. Also, my problem is, is I have debt before God. I haven't just offended him once. I've offended him many times. In fact, God doesn't just take my sin as a distant situation. Because he is the creator, and because I am his creation, he takes this Certificate of debt, very personally. I have personally offended the Creator, my Creator, your Creator. So here's the problem this is what I have, but this doesn't help me, does it? In fact, everything that I have, I don't want. This is the first side of the coin of my problem. So what do I need? What I need is this. My need is righteousness. My need is perfection before a holy God. In fact, the problem that I find is, is that what I have I don't want, and what I need I don't have. Everything that I'm lacking is standing right here, and I can't be made right with a holy God. No matter what I try to offer of myself, It all ends up being fruitless. It all falls through your fingers and has no benefit whatsoever. It doesn't matter how good I am. I'm not perfect. Only righteous people can spend eternity with a righteous God. 
And so now I have a massive problem. God is perfectly just, so he's got to deal with all this. He can't just let it go. We like the let it go theory, don't we? We like the whole idea of somebody coming up and picking up one of those old huge rugs and bringing out the little, you know, like the hand broom. What are those things called? Wh- whisk? Man, I didn't know that. Learned something new today, right? We love this. Just get it under there. Nobody will notice. Company's coming over. Get it under there, right? Cover it up, and you hope it doesn't make a lump, or you hope when somebody steps on it, it doesn't poof out the side, right? But that's usually what would happen to me. I've got so much to shove under the rug, it's all going to poof out the side. Because I can't hide it, and I can't deal with it, and God's not going to hide it for me. If he's just, he's got to deal with it. He can't just let it go. It's got to be paid for somehow. But here's the amazing thing. He's also perfectly loving. So he's got to provide a way. There's got to be something of significance beyond anything we've ever known or beyond anything that we could bring to the altar and offer in order for God to look upon us, granting us righteousness and perfection. In fact, here's the amazing thing when we look at the whole idea of Isaac. You've got Genesis 22 open. Notice it says, verse 7, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? We don't have anything to give to God. Look at Abraham's next remark. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. Now, here's what's amazing, verse 13. Then Abraham raised his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. Pay attention to it. How? In the place. Everybody see that? In the place of his son. It's the idea of a substitute. In fact, it's the idea of a substitute in such a way as to where God can still punish sin and not punish us. Don't we deserve the punishment? What did Edgar do? Anything? No. And yet what happens? Get off the altar. Put something in your place. Substitute. The idea that if we're going to be made right with God, here's what we find out when we go through all of our talents, all of our time, all of our endeavors, all of our schooling, all of our innovative ideas, all of our planning, everything that we tried to conjure and put together, here's what we find out. It's all filthy rags before a holy God. So we've got to get something outside of ourselves and outside of this world in order to bring to the forefront for it all to make sense. Very interesting passage. Turn with me to Colossians 2. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief in the New Testament. Everybody knows where that's at, right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Just remember, Gentiles eat pork chops. It's a good way to remember it. It's a good way to remember it. G-E-P-C, Colossians 2. In Colossians chapter 2, we're going to look at a couple verses here. Look at verse 13. Everybody there? When you were dead in your transgressions, and notice he uses past tense, and here's the reason why this is important. Every person in this room and every person outside of this room, that's where we start. We all start in a situation where we are dead before God, separated in our transgressions. It says here, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive 
together with him, with Christ. In other words, just as Jesus is resurrected from the dead, so he makes you and I alive together with him. And notice it says here, benefit number one, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Now, I'm not a scholar, but I'm going to go ahead and believe that the word all means all. Did you know that? All of your transgressions have been forgiven. All. 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 Everybody got it? I know you don't believe it because I don't believe it. I can't even wrap my mind around it. I can't even wrap my mind around the idea that there is no wrongdoing that is placed upon my account before a holy God. He sees me wrongless. And I'm inventing words in order to communicate the point. He sees me not separated from him. He sees me separated from sin. He sees the other side of that coin gone, and this is all he sees when he sees me. But not only that, there's more. Not only did he make us alive, and not only did he forgive us of all of our transgression, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Why? Because you who do not believe are condemned already. Because what we were decreed to be as dead people in our trespasses and in our sins were consigned to the lake of fire for eternity. That's where people who don't have life go. That's where people who are dead reside. It's the only fit place for them. No, 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 no. Look what it says. He's canceled out the debt of certificate. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why can't that say my mortgage? He canceled out my mortgage. Praise God. Everybody starts getting saved. Revival breaks out. Next thing you know, somebody's doing Blues Brothers cartwheels down the middle aisle, right? (laughs) He forgave. He canceled out my student loans. Amen, right? Think about whatever it is that is steeped against you that when your mind has a moment, you worry about. I promise you this, our sin problem is much greater than that. And yet, what does it say? Canceled. Canceled. In fact, when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Testelestai. Paid in full. Do you guys realize that that's like a a business term? It's the idea that when it comes across... And that final payment has been made. Everybody love it when you finally pay off your car, right? Car payments are from the devil. Let's just agree on that, okay? (laughs) Let's go ahead and do it. But when that happens and you have the title free and clear and that clerk stamps it, right? And there's something in you that goes, because it's good. Because whatever you are throwing at it, trying to pay it off, guess what? You don't have to exert that effort anymore. It's done. It's done. Now, here's the amazing part. He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, butting heads, constantly fighting, disturbing the core of our being. And he has taken it out of the way. You know what that means? That means that there is no wall separating anyone from Christ anymore. Here's the amazing thing. He didn't just die for my sins. He didn't just die for your sins. He died for everyone's sins. His blood is that sufficient. He's that perfect. But how was it taken out of the way? He tells us, having nailed it to the cross. Sometimes we say that, right? Nailed it. Exactly. In a way that we don't even grasp. Nailed. The canceled certificate of debt, boom, paid in full to the cross. Now, here's the problem. I've given you two terms down here at the bottom of the back of your paper. Take a look at those. They're underlined. Front-loading and back-loading. I feel like this is important for us to touch upon. When somebody front-loads the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're essentially giving a lot of requirements that need to be met before Jesus will save you. Now, think about this in the terms of sacrifice, offerings, altars, those types of things. Think about it for just a second. Requiring a portion of personal payment in order for one to be accepted before God. In other words, the sacrifice that was provided to make you okay with God was not good enough. 
How terrible would it be if you went to go pay off your house and you're a dollar and 50 cents short? You think that you would choke somebody out in the bank line in order to get a dollar 50 out of them? I think you would, right? So close. And what do you do? Oh, no. And the next and I'm hoping that it's Tom next in line, right? But then it's, he's gone. Give me that, right? And pay it off. Get it done. When we share the gospel with people and talk to them about how the sin problem has been paid in full and dealt with, any time that we put some sort of stipulation or requirement upon them in order for Jesus to accept them, we front-loaded the gospel. We've put, a, in other words, if, if Jesus has been the one who has moved the wall out of the way by the cross, we're the one that's trying to rebuild one, maybe not as tall, but still, you, you got to jump over it in order to get there. You can't be accepted about God by God because you have this and this in your life. Well, you're a smoker. You must be going to hell. You smell like hell. Is that true? I've heard that before. Think about it. Well, don't you know if you have that drink, there's no way Jesus loves you. Well, you've got that sin that you just can't quit. You better shape all this up. Does the gospel really make yourself better so that Jesus will find you acceptable? No, that's front-loading the gospel. That's putting a lot of stipulations on people that they can't possibly live up to. Why? Think back what it said at the beginning of this passage. You were dead in your trespasses. Dead people can't do anything. They're just dead. They're separated. So any kind of requirement of holy living in order for God to accept a person, let's rethink what exactly we're communicating to them. In fact, here's my favorite. And if I step on your toes, I'm okay with it. Anytime that we talk to somebody about keeping the Ten Commandments, and they're not a Christian, number one, we're not the nation of Israel. We don't keep Ten Commandments. Number two, a dead person can't keep any commandments. Do you realize whenever a Christian puts the Ten Commandments before someone, they just put them on the scale. How are you doing? You have any other gods before you? Well, what's considered a god, right? Did you blaspheme the Lord? Mm. You loving your neighbor as yourself? Mm. Did you lie to anybody? Mm. Did you covet that stuff? <gasps> Only thing they conclude is they're going to hell and there is no hope. We actually become scale givers. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. We actually put people on the weighing block when we call them to that. Now, the, the, the Ten Commandments is real clear about showing us what's wrong and why we need a Savior. There's never something to live up to in order to be accepted. That's crazy. Now, the other problem we have is, is backloading the gospel. In other words, once you believe in Christ, your performance had better project the idea that you have an intimate relationship with Him. Now, I don't know about you. But when you talk about sacrifices and offerings, this becomes a real touchy subject. Because after the sacrifice has been made, after the blood has been spilt, there now should be some sort of promise maybe to never do that again. Well, if you believe in Jesus, okay, and you promise never to do that again, then he'll save you or he'll love you. Or now that you believe in Jesus, you better act this way. And usually the way that we're telling people to act is all the sins that we've kind of got under our belts. We're good, right? I don't, I don't want to struggle with that. Do you start? Oh, come here. I'll tell you how to be holy like me. Man, that's scary. What does that say about the sacrifice that was given? It's not good enough. And here's the amazing thing about that, and I wrote this at the, at the end of that. We aren't sure until we see change. Remember this. Because when you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within you. He doesn't change people from the outside in. He doesn't start out here and work his way inside. No, he starts here and works his way out. Why? You need a different heart. You need a different way of thinking. And until we're convinced, walking in obedience to those things or being convinced mentally of those things, it'll never show itself here. It'll never happen. Now, here's the reason why. You guys realize what this is, you know? What is that? 
The cross, no? Stop and think. What is it? The cross. Good job. When little kids say it, it's cute. It's what? It's an altar. Do you realize that the cross is an altar before God? Anytime that people are bringing these sacrifices and there's got to be blood involved and there is a death that occurs and there's this idea of pronouncing my sin upon another so that he dies in my place and is able to satisfy a holy God in that situation and remove my guilt, not just my sin, my guilt. There's a lot of guilty Christians running around Understand what Jesus has done for you. He's not just relieved your sin. He's taken away your guilt. You are not guilty anymore. And for all that to be taking place right there, it all points to the cross. It all points to the idea that a holy God has found something so acceptable that he requires no further or additional or any after payment, no interest, from us. It simply pays the debt and then it paves the way. This is the glorious salvation that you and I have. Now, do, let me ask you this question. Think about it. Don't just say something, but think about it. Is this good news? It's real good news. Do you think there's some people we know of that need to hear it? Because any, get this, Any other way that anyone tries to get into God's good graces is by their own hands. And what we will see after that is failure, 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 failure. Only perfect people can dwell with a perfect God. Jesus Christ makes us perfect. So let's take this and let's tell people about it. Because it's that good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Lamb of God on the altar of the cross that takes away the sins of the world. This offering that is put forward on our behalf, God, we are the offenders, you are the offended, and yet you are also the supplier for reconciliation. Thank you, God, that you've made it plain It's not complicated, but it is humbling. There's no hoops to jump through. There's only a payment to receive, and it is paid in full. Father, bring to our minds those people that maybe we deal with weekly, daily that do not have the forgiveness of sins because they have not believed in Jesus Christ. Burden us with that. Give us courage to speak. Speak of the truth. Help us to understand Jesus has taken our sin. Father, help relieve us from guilt for past sins that we feel. One of the devil's favorite tools is a shovel to dig that stuff up and to throw it in our faces. I pray, God, we would realize the new life we have in Christ. Free of sin, free of guilt. Father, help us to be renewed by that beautiful situation. We pray in the name of Jesus, our sacrifice. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace.